what if I told you that you could predict the future? More so, that you're experts at it. You do it all the time, even right now. You look skeptical. Well, what's going to happen next? It's obvious. This may seem so simple to you because we do it all the time, but it's not trivial. You need to know about water. You need to know how it looks, about gravity, how things fall out of buckets when dropped. You need to know about social interactions, about pranks people play on each other, about potentially staged photographs for taken for the purpose of a TED talk. In a blink of an eye, you combine all of this knowledge to predict what will happen next. You can even feel the cold of the water as it splashes over your head and runs down your back. We do this all the time. With ease, you can predict what the last word will be at the end of this. You can hear of something happen to somebody and you know what it would feel like if it were to happen to you. This is the basis of empathy. We continuously run a simulation, an internal model of the world in our head to predict what will happen next. We call this thinking. We can think about what would happen if we were to do something without actually having to do this. But if we do this all the time, would this not interfere with how we see the world, how we feel the world, how we hear the world? It does. Of course it does. Let's take a simple example. Color. Black jacket, white shirt. Surely no two people would ever disagree on the color of a piece of clothing. Except we do, of course, all the time. You've probably seen this photograph of a dress. Some of you will see it as black and blue, and others of you will see it as white and gold. And there's heated debates about which of the two interpretations is correct. But whether you see it as black and blue or white and gold simply depends on the predictions your brain makes about the lighting conditions this photo was taken under. And I can prove that to you. Suppose we take two identical patterns that are in this image. And we will give them context now to change the predictions you make about the lighting conditions. Suppose you saw the snippet, the pattern on the left, on a grey autumn day. It might appear white and gold. Now suppose you saw that same scene again, half a year later, on a bright spring evening. It might appear black and blue. Note that nothing has changed about the two patterns, simply the context that suggests to your brain what the lighting conditions are under which this photo was taken have changed. The predictions we make about the world, consciously or subconsciously, continuously influence how we see the world. The instances where we can prove that this is the case, we call visual illusions. But this happens all the time. The idea that we have direct access to reality is a misconception. So what's the purpose of doing this? Why would we predict? Well, the advantages are obvious. We can anticipate and we can filter the information, the sensory information, for salient deviations from our expectations and anticipations. Anticipating the movement of an oncoming car is what allows you to avoid collision. Filtering the sensory information of the stage you've been looking at for a while now is what allows you to pay attention to what I'm saying. But how does this happen in the brain? For this, we turn to neuroscience. And these are precisely the question our lab is addressing. How does the brain generate predictions? And what are they used for? To do this, we typically start by training a mouse to play a video game. The mouse sits on a spherical treadmill and via its locomotion controls a video game shown to it on something like a mouse IMAX screen. <coughs> Excuse me. As the mouse does this, we record from neurons in the brain of the mouse. 
from a part of the brain that is responsible for processing visual information, the primary visual cortex. We use a method to visualize the activity of individual brain cells that you see here in this video as the mouse plays the video game. So we can watch the mouse think. Now, what happens as the mouse first explores a virtual environment and then learns about it? And then what happens if we change something about the environment it doesn't expect? Suppose the mouse were to run down a corridor. At the end of the corridor, there's a turn. The mouse turns, and behind the turn is an image. And the mouse sees that image. And this results in a visual response in the brain of the mouse. It sees the image. But now what happens with time? As it runs down this corridor for hundreds of times, just like us mice actually quite enjoy doing this, they run down this corridor hundreds of times, and they learn what they're about to see. So as the mouse comes up to the same corner for the hundredth, for the two hundredth time, what happens is it generates a prediction of what it's about to see. And these predictions start suppressing the visual response to actually seeing that image after the turn. So what happens if we remove that image, if we violate the prediction the mouse is making? Now the mouse knows about the image. It knows that there's, after the turn, there's an image. It will see this image. It runs down the corridor. It's still expecting to see it, but we've removed it. We've taken the image away. What happens in the brain of the mouse? There's a very strong response, a very strong deviation from expectation response. And this is the moment the mouse updates its internal model of the world and learns. So we continuously compare what we expect to see with what we actually see. We predict, explain away things that are close enough to our expectations to detect those moments where there's a salient deviation from expectation. These are the moments we update our internal model, we learn. When we learn to speak, for example, what we do is we compare an internal model, a memory of what we're trying to say with what we're actually saying. This is the reason your voice, our voice, sounds different when we hear it on tape. What we hear when we speak is a mixture of what we expect to hear and what we actually hear. These predictions can be so strong that they interfere with what we're seeing. Typos in our own writing, our partner's new haircut or new glasses. We miss things that are right in front of our eyes because we have a good expectation of how he or she should look like, and what we see is what we expect to see. So perception is always a comparison between what we predict to hear, to see, to feel, to smell, and what is actually there. Why does this matter? Well, suppose for a second, this finely tuned balance between predictions and actually sensory input were skewed in favor of predictions. One might see things that aren't actually there. One might hear things that aren't there, project intentions into other people that aren't there. Hallucinations and delusions. Conversely, if predictions were too weak, the world might appear unpredictable and magical. And intentions of other people hard to understand and one might resort to doing the same thing over and over again in an attempt to restore predictability in the world. The former are symptoms of what we call schizophrenia. The latter, those of what we call autism. So these neurological conditions may be the result of an imbalance between an internal model of the world, an imbalance in the comparison between an internal model of the world and the external world. But what does that mean for us here today? Well, next time you find yourself in disagreement with somebody, consider this. Because our expectations depend on our very personal experience we've had with the world, we differ in how we see the world in many more ways than simply how we judge the color of a piece of clothing. We create our own simulation, our own reality. 
to be able to learn to predict what will happen next. Thank you very much.